My name's John. I'll be taking you through the sessions that I've got lined up for you today. Unique content never seen before, not available anywhere else on the internet. Um, it's starting off with the retail price comparison. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, at 12.15 we've got a session on British cycling and what can be learnt from that um, and how you can apply those principles to your business because it's a genuinely amazing story and there's an awful lot to learn from it. Uh, price competition and how to do it. In particular, looking at the principles of price competition, the consequences for how you should go about doing those, doing it. Um, and then that last session of the day, something really practical um, with examples of how you can actually bring all of that to life. So, um, yeah, a metaphor for today, cycling. Albert Einstein apparently said, life is like a bicycle, to keep your balance, you have to keep moving. So, I mean, there's many parallels with business on that. Um, if you don't tend to your business, you'll fall over. Yeah. Um, yes, you can cycle around in circles, and you can do that in business as well, but equally, you can race in competitions. And to do those sorts of things, you have to steer the bike, you have to know where you're going, you have to have a plan, you have to know all the stages and steps in between, what the course is going to be like. Hello, come in. Grab a seat. You have to know what the course is going to be like, um, and effectively, you have to have a plan. So there are a lot of parallels between cycling and being in business, and that's part of why we've used it. Shop talk. I'm John, I am your business advisor. I'm employed full time by Target, I'm not the payroll, I'm not some consultant that's being paid to um, make money out of you. We provide shop talk and my services completely free of charge, they're entirely discretionary to you. I don't get involved in anything to do with selling. I'm product agnostic, as it were. Um, talking to me, me coming and visiting you, does not mean that you have to buy more Target products. Okay? Um, it started out in 2011 with a simple blog. Uh, Paul Cabbage, our MD, was being asked for business advice. And it's not that he doesn't like talking to customers, but he's got a day job as well. And um, he saw a need for that. He thought it would be something that would be really useful to you, our customers, and he wanted to make something of it, and employed me. I came on board at that time as business advisor. And since then, we've grown things quite a bit. We now do workshops, of which today would be an example. I run three other workshops as well, winning new business, get the customers you deserve, and I do a detailed one on making the most of the retail price comparison. All available free of charge, all running regularly. By the way, you've all got a business card on your seat. Um, please take and keep it. You never know when you might want to make contact. Yeah? You've got my email address there, you can reach me anytime. Um, mentoring, that's one-to-one -one where I go out and visit businesses. Sometimes it's just a single visit. It might just be a phone call for that matter. It doesn't matter. Um, but it's talking to you about your issues and your problems and giving you direct advice. Um, obviously, we've got the blog, which has grown dramatically since I came on board. I'm trying to add something to that every single week. Currently in the middle of um, a session on pricing strategy, shortly to move on to internet, which will be interesting. Um, opinion is a new one. Whilst the other things that we do are all around helping you with advice and guidance directly, opinion's a bit more sort of banging the drum for small independent retailers. And that's something Paul likes to do quite a lot. And there's a few pieces on there about various things that have been said and what people really meant or not uh, through those things. We've obviously got our forum, which is our customer exclusive area where you can discuss things in private with other customers. Ask each other about pricing, ask each other about technical issues. It's really up to you, and that exists really for your benefit. Um, and last but by no means least, we've got the research angle. The research angle is things like the retail price comparison, which we've now done twice, and we're going to run again. Um, we also do shopping preference surveys, 600 members of the public, how do they feel about using independent retailers, and we get some really interesting facts and figures off the back of that. Um, needless to say, social media, we're all over there. If you want updates to the blog, you win the prize. If you want updates on the latest blog, if um, you're looking for business advice, I regularly tweet business advice, things like changes to HMRC. Um, code of practice, changes in employment law, other piece, bits and pieces of business advice. Two posts a day, nothing that much. Follow me on Facebook. On Facebook, we're Target Shop Talk. On Twitter, we're at Target Shop Talk. On Google Plus, it's Shop Talk. On Pinterest, it's Shop Talk. LinkedIn works slightly differently. Grab a seat. LinkedIn works slightly differently. You'll have to find me, John Coulter. Um, we video these sessions and put them on our YouTube channel. You'll find them there, and as I said, you've got a business card, and if you want to reach out to me to talk about anything at all, how big or how small, it doesn't matter. It really does not matter. 
um, then please go ahead and do so. So, the retail pricing comparison. I'm going to divide this down into three sessions. Why we do it, what motivates us to do it, what the second comparison has found. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what the second comparison has found compared to the first, which is interesting. Why every retailer should take part. I would say that, wouldn't I? But there are some real good reasons why you should. So why do we do it? Why we feel we should? And how we go about doing it? Okay, these aren't nice words. There's actually some genuine business imperative behind this. We're only successful if you are. We don't sell to the public. It's all trade. So if you don't make it, we don't either. So we're motivated by a real business need to provide you with something that should work for you and help you. There's other prizes going in second place. Done. Um, yeah, pricing is a major competitive issue. We see it all the time. We're ideally placed to make it happen, and it's uh, worth our investment. What do those sorts of things mean? Okay, there's a persistent mindset with people that the big chains have this huge price advantage over you, and that you're competing with something that's impossible to, to win against. Um, it's absolutely not true. It's absolutely not true. Their purchasing advantage is nowhere near what you think it is. What they are able to do is to promote lost leaders, and that's what you're seeing, the consequence of lost leaders. In overall terms, they do not have major purchasing advantage. We see that price, people can generally talk about price being the key determinant, the one thing that makes people decide what they want to buy, whether they will or won't. Yet, we know that people will be prepared quite easily to pay more for something if it's better. The issue is, is what is better? Yeah, you go on Amazon, you want next day delivery rather than standard delivery. <coughs> Amazon don't come to you and say, oh yeah, we'll do next day delivery for you, and in fact, we'll do it for less. They charge you a premium. Welcome, come in, grab a seat. Yeah? They'll charge you a premium for it. People expect to pay more for extra things because it's better. And this general notion that price competition only means being cheap, which completely denies you of anything to do with what you're actually worth and how good you are. And I see stuff around people setting prices for sure, but they're not positioning them. People saying to me things like, you know, and I say, well, how do you set your prices? Oh, well, I charge what I think it's worth. I'm not even looking outside, you know, what other people are charging. I see people charging, uh, applying a buying kit cost plus approach. Twice has happened to me now, talking to people about the retail price comparison. You haven't quite completed it. Um, can I help you to complete it? I'll just take the remaining items, take your sale prices to me and add 20%. Two things about that. Blanket cost approach, well, different margins apply to different products, we're saying 20%. That's a criminally low margin, that is tough business. Um, and similarly, yeah, matching the internet. Well, yeah, I look at prices and they go and look at what online retailers are charging and the price of them. Again, completely forgetting the fact that the internet is serving an entirely different market. Gather competitor intelligence? No, thank you very much. Uh, it's only me here. I can't spare the time to go out and collect other people's prices. It's only me here. And absolutely, I understand that. I know that's true. I ran a small business myself. I know that the tensions that you're under, it was just me and one other guy in my business, and I found it very difficult to go away and do things like BNI networking and so on. But I did it. Snoop spy, no way. There's this kind of feeling that perhaps it's a bit covert. Come in. There's some seats over this side. It's all right. Come in. Um, it's kind of underhand. It's something that's not quite respectable to do. Um, but let me tell you something. Um, mystery shopping, going and looking at other people's prices is a practice that's as old as the hills. That's entirely respectable. <coughs> and if you're thinking like that, you're not actually thinking about the right way. There's nothing wrong in being curious. Yeah? If somebody says to you, what are you doing in my shop? The answer is, well, I hope you know, you've got a reputation, but you're quite good here. I wanted to come and just find out how, how well you do things. Likely you'll have a decent conversation with the person. But what would I do with that information anyway? So I get this pricing information, I find out about this other business, what am I going to do? Because see, part of the issue is if you find out other people's prices, how does that actually help you set rules? Yeah? If they're higher, do you raise them? And if they're lower, do you drop them? And what about if they're all around you, what do you do then? And how do you know how good those prices are? 
And how do you know how well those prices are actually performing for that retailer that you might have visited? You don't. Yeah, one of the main reasons for us doing the price comparison is we hear you talking about price all the time. We get posts on the forum. Okay, it's not a consistent thread, but it comes up regularly. People ask, what are you charging for? Um, we get really flattered. People literally ask us, well, what should we be selling this at? Typically, when we get into line, yeah. what's the recommended retail price? Thank you. Fabulous position to put us in. Um, but also a position kind of we don't really want to be in, because who is at our place? What is it our place to tell you what you should be charging? We don't know your local market. But if anything was a driver for doing this, that was probably the major item, because what better way to tell you what kinds of prices you should be charging by asking everybody else what they're actually charging now, and the satisfaction they're getting. Um, and price is an issue, it always comes up when I visit people. Well, ideally place to make it, make it happen. Clearly, you know, you're buying from us all the time, you know what you're buying, you've got all that record. Um, we're a common contact for thousands of you through the web. Um, and it fits our ethos. We have to do everything we can to make you successful because we will only be the same if we do that. And on the back of that, it's worth our investment. I'm not going to go through it all. Um, but we do quite a large amount of work to make this happen. We developed a complete web tool to capture the data. I go through the process of managing all the invites and the email letters, following up with people as the closing date approaches, and they've only done 55 or 60 of the answers um, that are needed, because if they don't complete, they won't get any data at all. And reminding them of that fact and helping them, helping them get it completed, all the way through to providing individualized reports. Once you've completed the price comparison, there's an individualized report that applies to you within the mix of everybody else um, and what that means for your pricing. One-to-one -one support. If anyone wants to talk about their data, I'm here. It's free. It's available. All you've got to do is ask. Um, and we've done things as well. Come in. There's some seats over this side. And we've done some things to improve the comparison to make it of even more use to you than before. And this time around we included some services, because people had said, why don't you need some services? Um, which was a more difficult question to answer than might, um, you might think, because PC Health Check, what is PC Health <coughs> Check? Different people do things in different ways. So we've started off with some things that we know we can hang our hat on. And that's what we saw in the survey. Um, and now, we actually provide a workshop. So people who have taken part, people who haven't necessarily taken part, and come along and find out how to really get uh, an understanding of the data and the information. And just why come to a workshop? Because we go through and in detail what the report contains. You, know, you get confronted with this huge spreadsheet of information, and I'll help you understand what that is. But most importantly, some actual hands-on practice using real information, anonymized, not yours, real information to look at price setting examples. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. 60 generic lines. Okay, they're more categories of products than individual specific products. They don't have to be from Target. Doesn't matter to us. We're just interested in what products you're selling. Remember, I said I was product agnostic. And the five basic services. And then quite simply, do you or don't you do it? What do you charge? It's inclusive of VAT because we have to deal with limited companies and sole traders at the same time, so we use a common language. Um, and an indication of sales. Now, we can't do that by how many units do you sell, because that will mean you either having to look through your records or possibly even creating records and going through the, the time to do that. And it wouldn't be appropriate for us to ask how much do you sell either. That's private confidential information. You know, in pound terms that you sell. So we, we do it through this proxy called sales satisfaction. And that's what we use. Um, we aim for 100 customers ish each time, and that's what we've achieved. We do the comparison with the big chains, and yeah, remember this, it's important. The comparison with the big chains is done using their lowest online price, which means the comparison is, is very harsh. Yeah, it's very tight. So, what did the comparison find? You versus the big chains. Where do you stand? What are the key movers? What do we see in terms of product popularity? 
some real insight into the truth about what we call price elasticity, that's the economic terms, or to you and me, the relationship with hype between price and sales. Um, and some overall suggestions for what you might consider stopping based on the information we found. Remember, if you took part individually, you get a far better breakdown. We can give you some insight. So here we go, the basket comparison. Those are the businesses that um, the comparison, the large uh, multiples that the comparison was made. Um, and those are the percentages. This is how much better you are than them, how much better your basket price is than those businesses last time. Okay, I will tell you. Oh, by the way, yes, I just made that point again. Online prices are, prices are often lower than those in store. So remember these figures um, probably understate your advantage. Where do we find it? Some changes. Some ups, some downs. A bit of closure in the gap between you and PC World. But look at the differences going on with Staples and the others. In particular, look at that one with Tesla. Very interesting. Does that drop with PC World spell trouble? Are they screwing down on you really tight and hard? It's very difficult to tell, to be honest. But we'd like to think it could be because you've been raising prices. And the reason for that is simple. A significant number of people who took part in the last comparison took part in the second. And they were picked up from the last comparison that there was opportunity to raise their prices. Secondly, you know, could it be the impact of mentoring that's getting through? Okay, I don't see that much business, those many customers, I should say. It would be uh, wrong of me to suggest that one individual could impact the, the amount of business that we do, but there are a number of businesses there who've all consented to be listed, who I've worked with, and have all increased prices as a result. Could it be the influence of the blog? <coughs> Price is so central to everything that you do that it appears time and again in things that I blog, but some of the major titles that um, represent material that relates to price and pricing are there. Maybe the message is getting through from that point of view. But let me ask you a question. Why is price important? Why is price really important? What does it do? What is it for? Why does it matter? Any thoughts? Value. Value. Putting value on the product. Putting value on the product. Okay, so, right, yep, any other thoughts? Property. Profit, okay, yep, it's now profit too. Appealing to customers. Sorry? Appealing to customers. Appealing to customers, yeah. Okay, let's think about the dangers of wrong pricing. <coughs> with that one. Yeah, if your price is seen to be fair, it's within the range or there or thereabouts, then that's something that will lead to good customer. You know, your reputation is one as a business offering fair value um, and fair prices. But there comes a point as that price is increased where suddenly people go, hey, hang on, that's a bit much. That's becoming, in my words, a good off. Yeah? Becoming a bit expensive. Um, and that will lead to some loss of customers. So, there also comes a point in the other direction where you think, that's getting a bit cheap. You know, I bought this for £10. Now, if I found it on the web for 75p, given how this needs to perform for me today, I'd be thinking, can I rely on that? Or will it break down mid-session just when I don't need it to? No, I'm not prepared to pay 75p. I want to pay a little bit more for something that I think before. So a lot of things that relate to, yeah, that relate to value, but also relate to reputation, your reputation. But as you said at the back, profit plays a part in this as well, and profit shouldn't be forgotten. And what I want to introduce to you now is a very simple concept, that if you're pricing even very slightly below what you could, you're actually putting an enormous burden on your business, a surprisingly large burden on your business. How price and sales really work. Okay, this is this price elasticity stuff. So if you look at price, if you look at sales, 
would you expect as a relationship? Well, as price decreases, volume goes up. That's the standard sort of supply and demand way of looking at the world. Yeah? And all we put in there, all I put in there is simply for every 1% decrease in price, there's a 1% increase in sales. What did we find doing the survey? So in October, we found that in actual fact, the relationship between price and increased or decreased satisfaction is actually very slight. Um, but something like 15% below the average price only produced around about 3% increased sales. But in actual fact, this elasticity is nowhere near as tight as you might have thought. All right, all very well, but what about the second time round? Well, in June, we found that. Yeah. Now, you know, we can argue about which is right and which is wrong. I don't think that's actually the point I want to make here. You know, two sets of surveys done in two different periods show that the relationship between price and sales is pretty much flat within reasonable boundaries. Yes, of course, if your price increases or decreases with particularly large, other things would happen. But within the ranges that we identified, those are the relationships we've set. But why? <coughs> why does price and sales behave like that, given the sector that you're in, given IT products? What is it about what you do that means price and sales are not related like you might expect? In actual fact more resilient than I expect it to be. Any, any ideas? Just for service. Service, yeah. Services. Value added. Value added. Now, IT itself is not a commodity. Many other things affect customers' perceived value. You know, buyers need trust, <coughs> excuse me, trust that they're getting unbiased, sorry, yeah, unbiased advice. And any reassurance and confidence in making the right decision. Yes, there are people out there who don't do that. Yes, there are people that are quite happy to go into a supermarket and buy a computer off the shelf. But I would argue that that's not the majority. You know, the majority of people do want to talk to somebody and have some reassurance that they're actually spending their money wisely. And that's why price and sales don't work in the same way that you might expect. Keen eye amongst you will realise that you can the wrong way around. Um, so, key movers, what have we seen? Satisfaction increasing on things like batteries and books, amongst everything else, not much of a difference to be honest. Um, and falling in particularly on things like the Blu-ray read writer, other end of life items. Nothing that really stands out. Britain's favourite meal, that's why I put it there as popularity. So, what about popularity? Well, unfortunately, no surprises, you stop what? You stop what we'd expect you to stop. Mice, keyboards, USBs, wireless adapters, and so on. And the least stopped items are these things. The other little bits and pieces that we do. Which is interesting. <coughs> you might ask the question, why do we bother? Why are we stocking everyday essentials? Why do we do that? Get frequent customers. Get frequent customers? Sorry? Skip fashion demand. Keep freshening the demand. Yeah? The impulse price. Sorry? The impulse price. Impulse price. Footfall. Footfall. Don't Great. Need to, don't need to go anywhere else. Don't need to go anywhere else. Yeah. They're all little things. They're not of much value. And they're not going to make us a fortune either. They won't make you a fortune. But yeah, they give other reasons for people to drop in. Yeah. And they do these two things that you should always be striving to do, which is turn every visitor into a customer making every visit pay. Would you be surprised when you actually look into the number of people who walk through your door versus the actual number of people who make the purchase? Typically when I work on work with businesses on that, it's not as high as people say it is. They usually come back and say, oh, the vast majority, 70, maybe 80 percent, we do some data analysis and it usually drops to perhaps 40 to 60 percent. So there's a considerable amount of business there that they're not making money from. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're going to make a fortune off the back of this product, but you've got a reason to start a relationship. They've made a purchase. They bought from it. But they won't sell themselves. 
Okay, these items need promoting. So, you know, visible, highly visible promotions in your windows, on your walls, get a bit feisty, make a point that you are now stocking for the sake of argument batteries. Yeah? You can do that with any of the other products as well. You need to merchandise these items. In other words, you need to make it obvious that you've got them in the shop. You need to make a display out of them. Not just have them on the shelf somewhere. And yeah, convenience purchases, place them near the till. Every buying customer goes through two places when they come into your shop, the door and the till. And if they've come to the till, you've got all those things there, they've got a chance to see them, for you to mention them, and for them to potentially buy. Um, and not as we've seen with some customers, um, yeah, on display but not priced, and worst of all, actually behind the counter. Yeah? Your everyday essentials don't sell for me. Oh right, how are you merchandising? Well, I've got them behind the counter. I wonder if nobody knows they're there. So yeah, it's all about your reputation. More reasons to go <coughs> through the door. Yeah? I'll live in there, they'll probably have it, or if they haven't, they'll probably be able to get it for them. That's where you're trying to position yourself. Giving more reasons for them to come in. And our dear old friend books. The dummies books. Yeah, they don't shift because people don't, remember I mentioned this term earlier, I think, consideration. People don't think of you as a bookshop. So you can't just put them on the shelves and behave like a bookshop. Yeah? People go to bookshops to buy books, so you have to think differently about how you're going to go about selling them. The basics still apply. You need to promote the fact you've got dummies books in the shops, if that's what you do. You need a poster in the window that talks to them, for example. You need to merchandise them, yeah? An obvious display of those books in the shop, yeah? If you've got a shop where you can walk directly from the door to the counter without anything being in the way, then people won't look around themselves. You have to lay out your shop so you get people to start looking about. And that's the art of merchandising. Um, and think about bundling. Every time you offer somebody advice, make sure you mention the relevant book. There's some extra advice on that. We spoke about websites and stuff. I gave you some hints and tips. I've got one of these dummies books on as well. You can see what happened. Um, or you might go a little bit further. Here's an actual example from a you know, company called Kim UK over in Hull. Um, it's not about the detail of what's in the, you know, whether the computers are right or wrong, or what the price is, it's how they've gone about doing it. And I think this is a really fantastic example. First and foremost, it's a targeted offer. Yeah? They read one of my blogs that speaks about thinking about the footfall that's outside your door every day. They realised that right across from them, because they're in a shopping arcade, or they were in a shopping arcade, was a hairdresser. A hairdresser is mainly frequented by Harry Higgins. What could they do? Well, immediately, silver surface. How can we help you? Well, you need more than just products, don't you? Because you're silver surface. You need some advice. You might not have been on the internet before. So they made a bundle, which included a Windows uh, dummies book and an hour's worth of free tuition. So not only were they selling the product directly, it was a targeted offer that included a bundle of products and services that really amplify their worth and justify the price. Yeah. Fantastic example. There's probably many, many others of these that you could think of. So, stocking suggestions. Back up. So these are items overall where we think there's opportunity. Yeah, mobile dongles, broadband dongles. <coughs> satisfaction 3.25. Three on the satisfaction scale, which works from one to five. I remember rightly, three is okay. It's a perfectly decent seller. In fact, it's slightly above 3.25. Perfectly decent seller, no reason to not consider it. Yet, only 55% of people who responded said that they stopped it. Clearly, there's people missing out on opportunity. Inks, 4.1 satisfaction. It's about the highest that there was in the survey. Tremendously satisfied. No wonder. You buy them at relatively low price and make quite a good margin. You know? and there's nothing wrong with that because that's the going rate. But at the same time, still only three quarters of customers are stocking. So people are missing out on a massive opportunity to make, okay, absolute sums might not be good money, but it's another reason to get people coming in the door. Come and buy my ink. Okay, why every retailer should take part. Well, no punches here, this is about what we're missing out on. This comparison survey is pretty
pretty special. It really is. I'm going to explain that to you. Um, and what you're actually really missing out on, and I'll call it easy money. Every single one person in this room is leaving money on the table, I guarantee it. When I look at all the surveys that we've done, there are significant numbers of products in everybody's results where they could increase prices just that little bit and make more profit. If your businesses are all surviving as they are, everything that you add on would be pure profit. It's all cream. We're doing stuff that you simply cannot. Okay, first of all, you don't have the time to go out and price survey 100 competitors. You're thinking that um, you know, going out and looking at an operation, collecting some prices, getting an assessment of how good or bad that, uh, that supplier is, that, that uh, competitor is, it's going to take you a couple of hours. 200 man hours work? That's not going to happen, is it? It's just not going to happen. And then you've got to analyse all that data. You've got to make some sense of it. So it's just not going to happen. But that's my point, and even if you did, you can't ask satisfaction, yeah? Oh, excuse me, I was just in your shop collecting some prices on the price of price now. Um, this price on USBs, could you tell me how satisfied you are? I think you know the answer to that. Yeah? Because if you know a price, how do you know how good it is? You don't. All you know is that you've got that price from that shop. So doing this survey doesn't just save you huge amounts of time. It gives you insight that you can't get anywhere else in any other way. It gives you pretty much the most helpful, helpful information in terms of business advice that I've ever seen. Because it enables you to set the prices not just on the basis of what others charge, but on the basis of the prices that perform best for those other people. And I think that is the real value added in this. Yeah? It's understanding what others are charging and how that's performing is the real, real insight you get from this. Are you missing out? The survey includes some information on uh, items that you don't stock. You'll see lots of here, it's in the don't stock tab. So these are items that everybody, this is real information, real data for a real customer, they'll remain anonymous. What does it say? 62% of people responded on cleaning products. I don't stop cleaning products. 62% of other people in, in the survey do. Right. Their satisfaction rating is fine. Yeah, it's a decent sell. There's no reason not to stock it. And look at the pricing. So I could charge anywhere between £6.70, £12 for that. Now we'll talk about some other factors in a moment that might suggest that you can charge more than £6.70 yeah? to do again with this issue of consideration. I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's one of the things that the survey gives you. Products that you could stop that you do not currently. But are you also missing out on a number of things? Are you missing out on knowing out that your prices are genuinely fair? Yeah? Are you missing on knowing, knowing that you've set them on the basis of data from a large group of other companies? Are you missing out on the fact that you're going to get wrong-footed on your price more often because it's more accurate and a better price? Yeah. You're going to get those price objections. It's not to say they won't be able to go away because people will always be asking for a bit off. Are you missing out on selling more because you can simply sell better? You can simply sell with more confidence. Now, are you missing out on losing bargain hunters yeah. because your prices are fair and they're not at the cheap end of the scale? Are you missing out on making more money? Suggestion here is not about profiteering, it's just about pricing right. So, to think about that, to get us thinking about that, we'll ask a question, a couple of questions. Consequences of price changes. Wake up. You buy something at £10, I think. What was that? That did happen to cost £10. You sell 100 of them at 13 And you decide, for whatever reason, if I want to discount this, I'm going to knock a pound off and sell it at 12 because yeah? that will win me more business. <clears throat> well, you're effectively giving some money away, remember, by knocking that pound off. So my question to you is, how much more business do you need to make in order to recoup what you've just given away in that one pound discount? Because you're going to need to sell more, aren't you? An extra 50%. Right. Anybody else? People think 50% sounds a bit high, a bit low. You don't need to sell. Sorry? You don't need to sell 100. You don't need 
you've got to sell another hundred, which is why it's so bad. Hundred yeah. no, percent. No, the fifty. The fifty mark. The fifty. Okay. Good. Let's look at it the other way. <laughs> we'll work, I'll give you what the exact number is in the moment. Yeah. Let's say it's the same product. We're in a, <coughs> we're in a different universe. We're in the green universe. Right? Because there's an infinite number of these. And yeah, you decide now I'm, I'm going to raise price of this. I'm going to go from £13 to £14. I'm feeling bullish about this. And of course, if you put prices up, some people go, no, thank you. So, how much, how many of those, what proportion of business? Could you lose and still break even? Twenty-five percent. Okay. Any other thoughts? A third. A third. Good. Excellent. Got some good mathematicians. Yeah. This is the relationship between break-even sales and price change. So, in other words, as you drop your price what happens to the amount of sales, percentage change of sales you need to make the money that you would have done before you changed the price. And you can see it depends on markup. For different markups, there are different lines. And that's how the relationship works. So yeah, we drop the price a pound, it's a 7% discount, effectively, on where you were. So to break even, you need to sell 44%. So well done. And if you price up by 7%, you need, you couldn't endure losing 23% of your business, so whoever came up with that one, I can't remember who it was. Well done on that. So it's good to see that some people have got their head around these numbers, but um, quite often a lot of people find that quite surprising. Quite surprising. But the issue here to ask yourself is, is discounting 7% likely to actually increase business that much? Now I can't answer that question for you. You know your customers far better than I do, but I would say it sounds unlikely. Unless you market it. Maybe it's the marketing that's worth, worth it. Thank you. Exactly. Because, yes, if you drop price, nobody knows you've done it. Do that. Unless you promote it. But the issue is, is yeah, the cost of the marketing, and could you actually drum up 44% of the business? How many of us in this room could do that? No. Similarly, is raising prices likely to lose you this much business? Again. I mean, you can answer that. And taking this right to the limit, going back to that point we made earlier, just pricing very, very slightly underneath what you could do reasonably. If on average your prices are just 3%, <coughs> a tiny amount, just 3% under what you could be charging, you are saddling your business every single day with needing to sell 15% more volume each and every single day. Just 3%. How many of us could do that? How many of us could instantly switch on 15%? We dropped all our prices 3%. We can't. Well, what are we going to get it another way? If you put those prices up and everybody purchased, you get 13% more profit. Yeah? Remember, your business was surviving before. All you've done is tweak your prices up, and you're finding that you can do it without detriment to customers, and there's other people in this room who've done it just the same. You'll enjoy it, that extra money. It goes straight to your bottom line. You were surviving before. This is creep all the way. Yeah, that's money to invest in the business. Yeah, get the new shops on, paint the walls, buy some new shopping, whatever it is that you want to do to improve your business and take it forward so that you can make even more. For you and yours, yeah, we're all in business. At the end of the day, you might want to drive around in a Mas you might not want to drive around in a Maserati. Okay, but you still need to put food on the table. If you've got family, you still need to clean the kids and all of that good stuff. Pay the rent, pay the mortgage and so on. So that money could be for you and yours. And of course, it could be for your staff. Yeah? So this is all money to help you really grow and benefit. And raising prices in line with your peers is easy money. It's really easy money. Okay, you can put prices up reasonably. And have no impact on sales. Very, very good. There are specific possibly local competition. We might have somebody over the road. I was only talking to somebody recently. There was literally a shop just over the road. And they're constantly battling on in ink prices. Clearly that's a situation that would be different. But how many of us have actually got that job? So, yeah, we help you make sense of 6,500 pieces of data, which is quite a lot. 
And that's a sample of one of the pages from a report. And I don't expect you to read all the numbers, that's not why it's there, but it's just to show you that it's a sea of information. It's an absolute sea of information. Um, but it's really, really, it's really good stuff. So yeah, we help you realise why you took part. Now, over the phone, ask me what you want, I'll work on your price data for you if that's what you wish. Now, I'll help you understand how to do it so you can do it for yourself if you want to come on one of the courses. It's provided free, it's without obligation. Export support, I've been a business advisor for five years. Now, who's up for some breakfast? But more seriously, um, I'm going to show you how to set a price using some data. I'm just going to walk you through the methodology, just use an example. Okay? Now, for those of you who might be thinking, oh, well, this isn't relevant for me, I'd hang on because I'm going to be talking about some interesting things to do with the big chains. For those of you who might not have taken part, this is still relevant because it will show you what the course can give you and why you should take part and have a benefit for you. And obviously, if you've taken part, it will give you some insight into what you need to do. Right. The rule book, the kind of background rules that we look to apply in the way that we approach the data and how to set pricing. First and foremost, the only thing that we say is not a dictat. There's people who've come on the course that I, I run who are clearly more than capable of interpreting the data and setting annual prices. Fabulous. But some people struggle. Okay, all this is doing is trying to provide a framework to help those people. What are the rules? First and foremost, go for peers first. Set your price with your peers and then think about big chains. Yeah, set your price reasonably with your peers and then think about big chains. The reason for that is very, very simple. Uh, it's all about not causing trouble with people like yourself. Uh, and the goals of price setting, we're always looking to adjust your prices to maximize, to be in line with those that give maximum satisfaction. We're looking on the basis, the way the methodology works is it's biased to try and find you opportunities to raise prices rather than lower them. There are occasions when a suggestion for lowering price does exist, and you need to consider that very, very carefully, because the impacts are, are big. But we're essentially looking all the time to maximize profit. Not profiteer, remember this is all about bringing market prices in line with what others charge. You know, the reasonable prices that they charge. Um, and in particular, yeah, are they contenders for price competition? And this isn't price competition with peers, this is price competition with big guys. Some terminology, I just need to get your head around. Okay, we take all the people who take part in the survey and we rank them from the most expensive on a particular product to the least. We take the top 25 and we call that Q4, the highest 25%. Yeah? The opposite end of the scale, we do the same. They're the Q1s, they're in the lowest price quarter. Okay. Um, and you can imagine what we do for Q2 and 3. Okay, straightforward. That leads to some reference pricing that we use to form this frame for when you're looking to work your prices. It's what we call the Q4 lower price. So in other words, the point at which prices start to become high, the point at which prices potentially become unreasonable, not necessarily so, it depends on satisfaction. Okay, but that's where we start. We do the same at the opposite end, which is the Q4, Q1 upper price, yeah, which is the price at which things look like they're starting to become a little cheap. And we've got the medium price, the price which is absolutely in the middle. It's not the average, because people don't visit averages, they visit shops. Okay, so the medium price is where there are 50 prices above that point, 50 prices below it. So by chance, if you were rolling a dice and you visit three shops, pure chance would say well, one would be more expensive, one would be less, and you would be in the middle. And on the other side, we've got what we call reference satisfactions. So within that high-priced group, there will be an associated satisfaction. We take the average of that group. We do the same in the bottom. And we take the average of the middle. So we get three satisfaction points by price. We're starting to use that data. And we put it all together, and that gives you the full framework that helps you set pricing. How does it work? All right, well, here's an example. So this is real data from a real customer. 74% of customers responded, pretty high proportion, good place to start looking. 
Okay, you can see, oh look, here's the median price, here's the quartile upper, quartile one upper, quartile four lower, and my price. Yeah, these are terms that you've seen before. My price is within the bottom quartile. The satisfaction data starts to appear as well. Again, you can see some of these terms coming out. The Q4 average, so the highest price people are that level of average satisfaction. In the middle it's there, and at the bottom it's there. So interestingly, we're getting the relationship here that says people are becoming more satisfied the higher the price. Again, that's all about this issue to do with um, price and value. Um, and again, at the bottom, we've got the big chain data related to this product. Yeah, so PC World, Argos, Tesco, and Asda. You'll notice Argos raises this heading here. We include Argos this time around because we had comment last time around, and it's a bit difficult to do that this time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Argos appeared. Um, it wasn't on the first slide because there wasn't a comparison to make. We didn't do it the first time around. But if you're interested to know, Argos, their basket was 5% low. Aggressive. Aggressive. But think about it. Think about it. We looked at their cheapest online prices. We, don't, we didn't look at their catalogue prices, and I don't know how Argos works, but whether there's a difference between the catalogue price and the online price, I don't know. Um, the other issue was is that the ranges that we were able to compare were relatively narrow, one of the narrowest of all. Because the amount of products that they're selling that actually stretch onto your patch is pretty small. Uh, this whole issue of customer consideration and customer experience, I think, needs to be taken account of. You think about it, the Argos shopping experience is one where you turn up, you look through a catalogue, you fill out the chit, and you get given a box. No advice, no guidance, no pre, no post support, no permanent whatsoever. So the people who are using this are people who feel confident in buying equipment in that manner. <coughs> they are people who do not see the value of what you offer. And this really, it's a difficult one actually to take notice of as a, as a, as a comparator, because it's really applying itself to an entirely different market. Anyway, come back to our example. So what do you do with all of that? Okay, so remembering our quartiles and remembering the different prices. Okay. What did we find? Uh, sorry, the satisfaction, I should say. What did we find? Yeah, we've got that increase in relationship and satisfaction going on. Bear in mind, current satisfaction is three. Right? So our model would say, well, what you should be doing is looking to move the satisfaction up to here. Consider that. What would be the implications for your price? So again, remember those price points that I spoke about based on the data? That's what they come to. Q4 lower, medium, and upper, Q1 upper. My price, six pounds. It's well within Q1. But if I move up to Q4, the suggestion is 10 pounds actually delivers better satisfaction than I am that I've got at the moment. That's a 66% rise. Now, just put that to one side for a moment. Remember I spoke about this point about what we're trying to do is always look to raise things rather than lower them. The way this model works all the time is we take your price quartile and compare it to the quartile where peers have highest satisfaction. That's the basis behind the model. And that leads to that in terms of target prices. Just from the point of view of considering what you do, I'm showing you this mainly because of the amount of blue compared to the amount of red. It's just going back and reinforcing that point. There are more chances to raise prices than lower. Sometimes the suggestion is that that could be the case. But when you do that, you always have to be very, very careful. We don't know your own circumstances. But going back to the example, yeah, hang on. Raise prices four quid, 66%. That's nuts. Everyone's in a dessert. All right? I'm going to be talking about things called chips and gremlins a bit later. All I would say to you is, well, okay, okay, but let's not get too bottom of the collar. Let's not get irrational about this. Let's think about the business implications. And it goes back to that stuff. Yeah, remember this, this model. So, that product, we sell at that price. If you look at it plus that and sell at six pounds, that, that retailer is making a 25% market. The suggestion is, is to make a 66% price rise. Our price change tool, which uses this, helps you understand the consequences. And the consequences are, the price change tool literally spits out this information. 
it's got some fancy macros in it that work and actually produce this thing. So in an existing arm cut, 25%, you could afford to sell up to 77% less units, three quarters less units. Before an increase in price of 66% will reduce your profit. Okay, thinking about that break even. Or looking at it slightly differently, raising 66%, raising price of 66% a bad idea. Is three quarters of your customer going to actually say no? Because you changed the price. Given the nature of that product, how many times are they actually buying it in the lifetime? It's not a fast moving item, is it? It's probably something they may only buy once. Yeah? It might be something that you include in a bundle when you're selling a computer. Yeah? That's it, you make one sale and never make another one to that customer. Or, for every people that would have bought before you made the price change, do you honestly believe that only one will now? Now again, I can't tell you which is right or wrong. What we're trying to do is help you move from <coughs> irrational thought to rational thought. Just provide you with that information. And it helps you say, well, in actual fact, I really couldn't see that happening. Or, yeah, in actual fact, no, yeah, yeah, I think it's worse than that. That's what we're trying to do. Our method is not about dictating how you should set your own pricing and what you should set them to. It's just about helping you understand the possibilities. Big chains, do they matter? Uh, no, not always. You've heard me talk about this point to do with consideration. Um, one other thing that matters particularly is locality. Yeah. I was talking to a customer recently who was on one of the price comparison courses and he said, gosh, I haven't realized the course I'm trying to compare myself to PC well, but in actual fact my problem, my problem competitors are Sainsbury's and Asda. Because they're in my locality, the PC well is miles away. Now, so are they actually convenient? Because remember, you do serve the local market. And if it's inconvenient for that local market to go to that other place, then it may not be worth including their price in your comparison. Would customers consider them relevant? So, yeah, maybe I'll go to this going to be a bad example now, but uh, maybe I'll go to Asda and buy a laptop. Would I go to Asda to buy that? I don't know. Would they sell it? Personally speaking, I'd be more inclined to either come to a shop like you or consider PC well, because that's what computers are. This is, this is sort of computing stuff. Yeah. Now, another angle on this is are significant savings possible? If it's a bigger ticket item where a few percents add up to a reasonable amount of pounds, then customers are likely to a bit of internet work, can't they? Where can I get a decent price? So that will bring those larger players in as well, what they're charging. Or is the price common knowledge? Fast moving items are a classic on this one, so your media, yeah? things like the batteries, paper, inks. Yeah? People buy them regularly, they build up a knowledge of what the price should be. If yours is out of line, they'll notice quickly. So what about the big chains? Well, this is what we know from the example that we're doing, and I'm just going to assume that all those big chains matter. Okay? So there we go. That's where it all sits. Now we've got the full picture about price for this particular product. What do you do? Oh, there's no rules on this. It's entirely up to you. But what I would suggest is you've got a gap, haven't you? A four pounds gap. Is that something you want to exploit? Would developing some promotional material that says, I'm selling these speakers four pounds less than PC World be worth doing? Maybe not with something like this, but where's a good example of where there's a product that the big chains are selling that is massively overpriced compared to yourself? What's a good example of that that you might want to promote? Clean. Ink. Paper. Pardon? Paper. Paper could be another one. Yeah, that's one I'm really thinking of. Cables. 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 There's an anecdotal story going around. I don't know where it came from. Anecdotal story going around. The PC World pays for all its real estate, the rental and upkeep, through the profit it takes on its cables. <laughs> and if you think about it, you know what you buy from that, and you know what they're selling them. The margin is just monstrous. So you've got an opportunity to point out to the public they're being duped. Ah, Mr. Retail, you care about me. Ah, Mr. Retail, what else do you sell? Yeah? Suddenly you're repositioning yourself completely in people's minds. So you might want to exploit that gap. Maybe not for this product, but possibly for others. 
Do you change your price? Do you think, no, in actual fact, I'm going to price the same as Tesco? I don't know, you might want to do that. I don't think it's relevant. I don't know that I would consider Tesco for this kind of offer. <coughs> you may think different, and that's fine. It's your decision. What I'm trying to do is give you a friend. Or, because we know satisfaction increased inside Q4, the higher the price went, perhaps you want to go above 10 pounds, and that's fine. It's up to you. We're just working on the information we've got, which is providing you with that data. Or maybe you want to do something, my 10 pound item wasn't expensive enough and was already broken down. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you want to price um, something entirely different again. Okay, the choice is yours. What I'm trying to do is show you a path. Yeah, tables. Get feisty. Now I'll come back to this um, theme again and again and again. And there's good reason why you need to do this. And I'll talk about that a bit later. But yeah, cables will buy you for this. We've got some good examples from customers in this room about how they sell cables. And here's an example of a customer, the same one who realized, oh God, it's not PC World, it's Asda and it's Asda and Sainsbury's. Who changed his price? That's just a close-up of the previous one. What he's done. He put his prices up and he's put some a little bit of extra information and to just point out something that people might find interesting. Now a single person has complained about his price rises, which basically commented on the extra information. So it's entirely possible to do. So, thinking about what we've done, this has all been about the second retail price comparison. You've seen the data, you've seen how things have largely improved for you, your fortunes have largely improved. PC World things have got a bit closer. We like to think that's possibly the result of you raising prices. Difficult to tell. Things. Um, we've looked at modeling price. How do you use the information from the retail price comparison to actually do something? Yeah? All as part of, you really should take part. Yeah, just about to finish. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, some great examples about selling non-traditional items, I don't know what they would call it, the everyday essentials, the books and so on, thinking about targeted offers and bundles. That's a real example of innovation, honestly. You could do this too. Anyone of you could do this. You could create the same offer and probably think up other relevant offers really easily. But it just involved thinking, who's outside my door and what would they buy? What are their needs? And we came up with a solution. Go on. And yeah, get feisty. Excuse me, where you find an opportunity, where you find an opportunity to exploit a price gap, you have to exploit that price gap. It is not enough to know that it exists and to be able to talk to people who come in the shop about the fact that it exists. You need to tell the people who have yet to visit you that it exists. Yeah? That means it has to go on your website. That means it has to go into emails. That means it has to go into your shop window if you've got it. Because otherwise, how will pass it by now? How does anybody who's not ever used you get to find out that that's the case? Yeah, yeah there's another example on batteries. Why pay more example? On batteries. batteries are a great one. Again, that's where they, uh, that's where they, that's where they uh, make their money, I should say. A um, couple of other things. Yeah, you've taken part in the survey. Well, some of you have taken part in the survey. Tell people that you have done that. Give them a reason to come in and talk to you. There's some artwork. If you go to my Pinterest page, Shop Talk Pinterest page, you'll find this artwork. We're also creating it and making it available over time in a printable quality to A1. And there's one of these posters actually already available that uh, you can find. But you need to tell people, because if they see that in the shop window, ah, oh, you're price conscious. Don't go and find out. I'll give you a go, I'll try you out. Um, yeah, we help people with media publicity as much as there's a press release I've put together. That doesn't mean it has to be used. And at the very least, people should just, if they've taken part, make contact with the media. I've taken part in the National Retail Price Comparison. On average, online prices were found to be 11% thing better than the PC world. Is that a story that you'd like to know? Let me say no, let me say yes. There's two examples. This time around, this time around we've got uh, at least three sets of PR. Now. 
the uh, relationship between price and volume um, and how really it is really quite flat. There is nothing to be afraid about in increasing or decreasing your prices within reason. Okay. Within reason. Oops. Well. Yep. We, looked about the, we looked at the merits of taking part in the price comparison. I can't stress enough the value that I think it gives you. Yeah, this insight into not just getting a whole load of pricing and thinking, which one shall I use? Yeah, uh, I'll go for that one because it's a nice number as well. It's a nine or something like that. Yeah, you go. No, I go for that one because I know it works best for everybody who took part. And that's the real value. Um, yeah, we did. We did the example. That's the end of this presentation. Okay, you've got my contact details. Questions, I'm here for questions now, I'm here all day obviously for questions. If something occurs to you after today, you've got my business card, you can email me, you can perfectly happy. I'm perfectly happy to be called. It doesn't matter. Big issue, small issue, any issue whatsoever. If you're interested in regular updates, not just on what's going on in the blog, but anything to do with business, YouTube, social media, marketing, anything that I think it would be of potential use to you, I push out on social media. You can follow me on Facebook, Target, Shop Talk at Target Shop Talk on Twitter, Shop Talk on Google Plus, Shop Talk on Pinterest, LinkedIn is John Coulter, We've got our YouTube channel, you'll be able to get videos of today through that, and of course as I said before, there's the email. Thank you very much.